Welcome to Swing Trading Live. This is the only live stream for those who are swing traders, want to know different plans, different strategies, different type of top stocks of the day and of the week. We do that here every single day. And I'm so excited. We got a lot to cover today. Market breakdown, top stocks, $8.1 billion in puts being bought by institutional traders, how to grow a small account, and so much more today. So Without further ado, let's get into this. So, as always, we look at the S&P 500 first. The S&P 500 is the overall market. This tracks the top 500 stocks and, um, and the 11 sectors of the market. The reason why this is important is because when we get a good understanding of where the overall market is going, we get a better understanding of where individual stocks go. Thus making successful trades because when we put the market and the sector and the individual stock in our favor that's like all three things all at one time and so again that's actually something that i've added to the software that's really cool so like for instance if we look at dollar general um if you come in here you can actually look at a sector analysis section um and see okay is the stock and an uptrend is the sector that it's in and an uptrend is the market as a whole and an uptrend Again, not. But when you have um, a congruence and alliance of all these things in one, like for instance, when the stock and its sector and the overall market are in an uptrend or they all just enter an uptrend at the same time, then guess what? You're going to have a really great chance of a profitable and easy trade because you put everything in alignment. And so again, that's a great little feature to look at on the software. Again, free 14 day free, uh, 14 day free trial link in my uh, description below. But anyways, what we're really here to discuss is the overall market. So again, what we can see here is the overall market was in an, an uptrend here uh, since 2020 and the initial crash. Then we had a downtrend recently over the last few months. And now we're like doing something iffy where we're going up, but it's unsure why. And so again, let's take a look at this. So we're charting it out. We have an uptrend here. Um, so an uptrend is defined by higher highs and higher lows. Then after that, we have a downtrend where we're just coming down. So again, that's defined as lower lows and lower highs. Um, and then now we're kind of in a weird transi transitionary phase where we seem to be very neutral in the market between 3635 and a high of roughly 4336. So again, we seem to be neutral in this level and no clear direction either way. And again, this is very normal um, if you talk about it from a ta from a financial perspective, a, a, I mean a technical um, basis. And so what I mean by that is we have trending phases, we have range bound phases, and we have trending phases, and we have range bound phases. And what it's actually called in a book that was done, um, it's called technical, uh, the technical analysis of the financial markets um, trading phase. And so again, this book is kind of what laid out the whole thing. I'll show you an, an image of the book. If you, if you can get your hands on this book, I would highly recommend that. If not, a free PDF online will do the trick. Uh, this is an amazing book to read for all up and coming technical analysis people. But anyways, we look at technical um, analysis, basis of the market. I'm sure we can get an example. So basically, this is what we're looking at. This is what's discussed in that book is there's four market phases and every type of thing. You have a accumulation phase followed by an advancing phase, followed by a distribution phase, followed by a declining phase. And so again, if we're looking at the overall market, what we see here is our advancing phase, our declining phase, and now our distribution phase, which again, we have a solid distribution phase that forms. Then after the distribution phase, we have an um, accumulation phase or an uptrending phase, which again, will most likely correlate and co coincide with um, the uh, end of November coming for the midterm election cycle and statistics behind that, which I've covered in a previous video. Anyways, that is the overall market long term. If we zoom in to get a closer look on the one minute chart, what we're going to see here is that um, this was the price activity uh, from from yesterday. Um, and so on Wednesday, we had a nice huge run up. We had an initial dip down. We broke above this. And again, this is kind of what we were alluding to in the live stream yesterday. The live stream yesterday, one of the one of the game plans was um, if we break above this trend line, then we're going to see a break above up to the highs. And so again, that's actually what we saw here, that huge run up. So anyways, um, that's always something to look into is having the live stream um, kind of help you with that. 
Now what we're looking at is a potential 10% continuation play. And what I mean by that is when we close in the upper 10% of the trading range of the day and we hold this level, then we have a good chance of um, breaking higher the next day. And so again, this is all revolves around this price point, right? If when the market opens, if we can break above this price point without coming down too far, then we're going to set a really good level and potentially break this and have a breakout to the upside. But again, right now it seems like it's being rejected. But again, what I do want to mention is the economic news for today um, is very important. We have Fed Chair Powell speaking at 9, 10 a.m. This is being 8, 10 a.m. Uh, my time. So that's going to be roughly four minutes. Um, so again, this is going to be a very important piece of news because the Fed is setting everything right now. Um, the Fed is saying exactly what's going on again. I'm hoping to catch uh, the live stream somewhere here of Fed Chair Powell speaking. Um, we can watch it all together and kind of talk about what he said and what, how that's going to impact the market. Um, but anyways, that's kind of what's going on from this perspective is we're expecting bullish if, if, if we break this line, if we continue trending down, um, then we'll probably re or come back down to around 3924. So again, we're looking at the futures right now of the S&P 500 because the futures give us um, this um, um, price action activity um, from the aftermarket and pre-market hours. Um, unlike SPY, if we go to SPY right now, um, it's going to be hard to see. But anyways, you can see here, this was our game plan for yesterday, right? If we break here, um, then we're going to break here and then head higher. I mean, that's kind of what we got. So um, now we're looking to break this level and hopefully head up to the next high of 401. We'll be looking into that soon. Right now, Fed, uh, Fed Chair Powell is about to speak in three minutes. Um, so let's see if we can find um, a live of him speaking. Okay, here we go. I don't think the sound's coming through. How do I add sound? Okay, how do I add volume? extent by pandemic related shutdowns as well as strong demand uh, particularly goods demand 
I, I think cars are, are a good example. So yes, people had money and rates were low and demand for cars was strong, but also the pandemic shifted demand and it shifted demand upward for cars because some people wanted to avoid public transportation that amped up new demand uh, demand for new and used cars and, and also the shortage of semiconductors for cars emerged from pandemic related demand shifts as well so uh, you know the bottom line for me uh, is that there's really a role for both here and the two are tangled up in a, in a way that it's really not easy to disentangle yeah you know, those of us who grew up in the 70s, uh, I think that the uh, danger and cost of inflation, you know, can't be exaggerated. Uh, in September of 1979, his first testimony, a month after he was confirmed, Paul Volcker made clear he understood the, the damage that was being caused by inflation and the need to bring it down, even if it required uh, great costs and other, other economic ways. Uh, one of the lessons of that episode was the greater the extent to which inflation slips the leash, the higher the cost and greater economic damage necessary to bring it under control. Uh, I so we have the Fed Chair Powell speaking right now, um, and then we have the natural gas storage and crude oil inventories. Um, these are marked as yellow, although I don't know why. Um, this is actually more important um, than it's showing right here. The reason being is because oil has been the number one leading sector in the market right now. Uh, oil uh, has been taking off, and it's been helping the market actually stay positive. And so again, oil has been a, playing a huge factor in the market right now. And so again, if this gas storage and crude oil inventories are all for anything like that, then we're going to see a huge effect on the oil sector, which is going to affect the overall market. Anyways, good morning, A. Ramos. Great to see you. What Paul Walker did and the Fed did to finally get inflation under control followed several failed attempts to get inflation under control. And, and what had happened over the course of that long period of the great inflation is that the public had really come to think of higher inflation as the norm and to expect it to continue. And that's what, what made it so hard to get inflation down in that case. So it, it is very much uh, our view and my view that we need to act forthrightly strongly as we have been doing and we need to keep at it until the job is done. To avoid that, we think we can avoid the, the kind of very high social costs that, that Paul Volcker and the Fed uh, had to bring into, into play in order to get inflation back down and set us up then for, for a long period of, of price stability. Um, you know, the, 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 that speech, the, the point really there was to deliver a, a, a speech that was narrowly focused on inflation, more direct and a lot shorter than a typical Jackson Hole speech. And I thought that what was appropriate was a very, you know, kind of concise and focused message. To your question, uh, the message really was that the Fed has and accepts responsibility for price stability, by which we mean 2% inflation over time. That, again, to your, to your question, the longer inflation remains well above target, the greater the risk that the public does begin to see higher inflation as the norm. And that has the capacity to really raise the costs of, of getting inflation down. So finally, history cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. I, I can assure you that my colleagues and I are strongly committed to, to this project and, and we will keep at it until the job is done. I can also assure you that we never take into consideration external political uh, uh, considerations. You know, we, we, we are accountable to the public through Congress. That's, that's a very fundamental, important aspect of our work. But it, it, we, we do not, we, we, we focus solely on the goals that Congress has given us, and that's what we're going to do here. I think that, um, you know, that's really important. Guys, the Fed is going to set everything, and the Fed is what's going to determine this market. The Fed has been determining the market for the last year. Like, our economic standpoint looks bad on a financial and fundamental level. We don't really have much support in the economy. Um, and so the reason that it's going up and the reason why it's not crashing as fast as it should is because of the Fed holding at certain levels. And so whatever Powell decides and the Federal Reserve decides to sell whole is going to really affect the market. So that's why this is important news for this morning. And we'll see the market reacting accordingly. That's why I'll keep flipping back to spy on occasion. concern that despite your stated resolve, the commitment to price stability has become less strong. Um, you know, should there be, should you consider modifications to this framework to raise these concerns and better manage short-term expectations? 
So the, the framework, um, we, we uh, began the work on the new framework in uh, 2018, and we announced uh, the results in August of 2020. And it really followed 25 years, basically, of global disinflationary forces. And, and the, the problem was that monetary policy rates were, were close to the effect of a lower bound much too much of the time, much too close, and even during good times. So that meant that central banks uh, were having a hard time all over the world, you know, finding ways to support the economy when it was needed. And that's why central banks, including the Fed, resorted to things like forward guidance and asset purchases. So that's that's why we did that. But the changes that we made were were sort of ver a very mainstream part of, of, of a literature around makeup strategies. But, but really, the point of our framework changes, the point of all of them was to and we said this very clearly, was to have inflation expectations well anchored at 2%. That, the, the, the average inflation targeting idea was meant to support having inflation expectations. That is the goal at 2%. And the reason is that we believe that the public's expectations of future inflation will play an important role in the actual path of inflation. So that's the, that is kind of the fundamental basis of our framework. And to, you know, as I just discussed, it is very important that inflation expectations remain anchored. I think the evidence today is that if you look at longer term expectations uh, by households, businesses and forecasters and also markets, you'll see that they are pretty well anchored around 2%. Of course, short term expectations are, are higher because of high current inflation and also the clock is ticking. As I mentioned, the longer that uh, inflation remains well above target, the, the greater the concern that the public will start to just naturally incorporate higher inflation into its economic decision making. And our job is to make sure that doesn't happen. And we're committed to doing that job. It seems to me there's a chance it, 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 the, uh, there's, there's a real risk that the labor market, uh, <clears throat> that the labor shortages persist. Does that create a risk that um, takes some of the ability to manage this process out of your hands? To the extent that there continue to be labor shortages, does that then feed into expectations that the public has about inflation, as you mentioned very prominently? Uh, well, I think you, I think you're right that if if it does turn out that we are in a world of a persistent labor shortage over time, that will be that'll be a challenging world for companies, and and it will certainly create upper pressure on wages and that sort of thing. Uh, today, the labor market is demand is very, very strong. Still in the labor market, we're still um, printing new payroll job numbers at a high level. Wages um, are are running at, at, at elevated levels, and um, so we think by uh, uh, by our our policy interventions, what we hope to achieve is a period of growth below trend, uh, which will take which will cause the labor market to get back into better balance, and that will bring wages back down to levels that are more consistent with 2% inflation over time. That's that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, the shock to labor supply that we got from the pandemic was large and unexpected and unfortunately persistent. I will say that it just in the very last... Uh, the labor supply shortage is less of a logistical and math and economical problem and more of a psychological problem. What I mean by that is people aren't working because they don't have to, because they're getting checks from the government, like the California Inflation Relief Program, things like that, that they're being provided for. So why would they go out and get a job? And also jobs aren't really that like appealing to most people. Obviously, who wants to work when you don't have to? And so because of that type of war between themselves, um, we're seeing that labor shortage because people just aren't going to work. And also because of the pandemic, people are learning that they can survive on less. So why would I need to work as much? There's been a huge, there's like a huge push in both ways. One of people pursuing part-time jobs and learning they can live on less. And two, it's called the overemployment movement where people are taking on two, three, sometimes even four remote jobs because they're learning that. On a remote job, all they have to do is they can get their job done in two hours. And so if they can do their job in two hours 
and they want to have an eight hour work day, just take on four remote jobs and that makes up eight hours a day. And so it's showing that work is really weird. So again, we have a mix of people not wanting to go to work with a mix of overemployment. However, people not going to work is strongly outweighing the number of people who are going to the overemployment movement. But again, if you want to learn about more of the overemployment movement, it's overemployment.com. It's an interesting read. So to, to, to go to this current situation, so as part of our response to the pandemic, we did resort to uh, large asset purchases to address what were pretty severe disruptions in markets, and then also to support the economy and our balance sheet expanded dramatically. But remember that our our purchases of securities don't actually increase the, the quantity of, of government obligations held by the public. They really change the mix because we issue bank reserves to pay for those securities. So we're not changing, you know, the, the quantity of, of obligations. That is not to say that, that money growth wasn't high. It was, of course, extraordinarily high in 2020 and then slowed down in 21. And now it's now it's quite sluggish. And I, I guess I would just say, say it this way, um, whatever caused, you know, there are different theories on what caused the inflation that so suddenly jumped up uh, out of the ground in March of 2021. Whatever what? Was, the relationship what do you mean <laughs> the idea between what caused inflation? Has Hold on. Been, uh, much more unstable than it was in Freeman's day for a very long time. Printing money? automatically increases inflation. So that's going to be almost a direct correlation between the amount of money we printed in 2020 and the increase in inflation. Of course, that happened. That was going to happen, right? When you have more of a supply of something, it becomes less valuable, thus inflation increases. And that's how that works. And the amount of money we printed in 2020 was so insane that it literally makes up 50% of like the whole money supply we have in reserve. And so it's something around that percentage but don't quote don't quote me on that but it's roughly that amount and so that's insane so of course the amount of money we printed in 2020 had that direct impact on inflation increasing inflation thus while we saw why we saw a huge push in the market because one people have a lot of extra money from the stimulus checks and stuff like that but also they understood inflation was increasing so they need to put their money into an asset that was increasing in value that's why we that's one of the reasons why we saw a huge market increase in 2020 to 2021 um, we saw a huge bullish market was because of that. People understanding inflation was going to be increasing and we need an asset to put our money in. The market being very easy and accessible in that movement. And so that is that that is probably one of the main factors of inflation. While we saw the huge spark up in March 2020, um, even though I know uh, he did not want to comment on that. Partly because, as you say, monetary policy is not suited to address you know, some well suited to address supply shocks. Uh, could you share with us some of your thoughts of, of that type of approach and whether it's something that way and a model of, of explaining how monetary policy will react and some kind of Taylor rule is now very much part of the way we think. In terms of nominal income targeting, and I, by the way, I know that Cato and, uh, is, is one of the home courts for nominal income targeting along with Mercatus and some others. And um, I, I, I know that this is a, you know, a lot of well-known experts who any of them have appearances. So basically that's Fed Chair Powell speaking. Um, he's made no clear remarks on anything. Um, but again, that's fine. Uh, we are seeing the market sell off though right now. So that market sell off is kind of um, not appealing. The reason being is because if we want to see a bullish day, we wanted to stay towards this range, this range being around here. So the fact that we can't hold this range and we've been trending down shows a lot of signs of weakness. Um, so again, uh, we'll be looking at this and market open in about six minutes. So that's kind of what we have our eye on. Um, outside of that, we have, um, you know, Fetcher Powell speaking right now, but then we have the natural gas storage and crude oil inventories that are going to be very important because if we look at um, some of the market XOP, um, oil gas exploration, that's exploration. Uh, what's what's it? Um, XLE, again. Oh, this is on a, that's why. 
So energy, you can see here a very positive movement so far in 2020, 2022. Um, XOP um, making a very pop positive movement as well. These sectors, uh, the energy, particularly the oil, um, has been carrying the market uh, in 2022. Um, so again, this will play a, a bigger effect on, on the market than I think it's saying. Um, talk about that later. We have five minutes until market open. Until then, uh, we'll see what Fed Chair Powell has to say. Um, and then when market opens, we'll get into breaking down the game plans for the day. Examples that would be difficult. One in particular would be: What do you do with changes in trend growth? We have, uh, uh, you know, highly uncertain estimates of, of levels of trend growth that we amend down through the years. And many years, you know, many years later, we may have a very different view. But it is broadly understood, I think, or believed, thought that, that trend growth has declined consistent or considerably rather over the course of the last, well, since the global financial crisis. So. How do you incorporate that into a nominal income target? Do you just raise the contribution of inflation, or do you annually re-estimate trend growth? And if you do that, you're incorporating both communications issues, but also, uh, you know, just big chances of policy error because we just don't know these things with that kind of we don't know any of the of the starred variables, so to speak, with with that level of certainty. So I'll just say. It's it's uh, it's a re really interesting and it works very well in, in models, but it seems difficult to implement from a practical standpoint, and it's not something that we that we have chosen to do or that we you know, are currently looking at. You mentioned the dual mandate. Um, you know, I don't want to ignore the unemployment rate during this conversation. Um, you know, when I said earlier that you know, we obviously have an aversion to a you know, fully discretionary monetary system. Many of us also regret the adoption of the dual mandate uh, in lieu of a strict focus on monetary stability. Um, the Fed's own website acknowledges that maximum employment is driven mainly by non-monetary factors. And if we accept that, does it really make sense for employment to be part of the Fed's mandate? So, Peter, as you know, uh, we are uh, we're created by Congress in statute and Congress assigns our goals and it has assigned maximum employment and price stability. It's my view that the dual mandate uh, has served the public well and is generally workable. In particular, at the moment, I don't see the two goals as in uh, conflict at all because without price stability, we, we, we will not be able to achieve the kind of strong labor market that we want for a sustained period that, that benefits all. So I, I don't see a case for moving to to a single uh, mandate, but that's that's really a question for Congress, and you know we will, will we will we will of course implement whatever mandate Congress gives us. To your point about maximum employment, it, it's true that, and we do say that that uh, uh, and have for some time that non-monetary factors are really what drives the level of maximum employment, which clearly changes th you know through the business cycle and over time. But we we can and do assess that, and we do it transparency. And and you know Congress has said that should be a goal, a co-equal goal with price stability. So that's what we're implementing. And again, I wouldn't, I, I don't think there's a strong case for changing that. I don't think it hampers us in our pursuit. And I think we can achieve both goals in the medium term. You stole my follow-up because uh, you started <laughs> out saying Congress sets the mandate, and so my follow-up was going to be, well, should the mandate, you know, should, should they consider changing the mandate? And I think you've uh, you've answered that, but uh, I guess a natural follow-up might be then that you know if the dual mandate weren't enough, there's been talk of adding more, um, you know, more more elements to you know the Fed's objectives, including like racial equity that seem you know far from the Fed's ability to address. Uh, in addition, you know, the Fed's remit has expanded from the banking system to the broader financial system, and its regulatory responsibilities were widely expanded in the wake of the financial crisis. Uh, you know, how does continuing expanding the Fed's mandates not undermine focus on that fundamental responsibility of monetary stability, you know, beyond things such as the, you know, the employment element of the mandate? I, so I think our, our current mandate is appropriate, and I, and I do not, I would not want to see it narrowed or broadened uh, for that matter. We've got narrow and we've got well-defined goals that we're supposed to pursue. And what we get with that, what we've gotten with that is a precious grant of independence that lets us pursue those goals without direct political control. For monetary policy, that's maximum employer and price stability. And I think 
All right, we're going to end it there. We learned a lot from uh, Powell. Again, we knew already that Congress sets um, the uh, um, objective for the Federal Reserve. Um, and the Federal Reserve works for the public, da, da, da. Um, but again, what we're seeing here is, again, the obvious push, which we kind of knew, um, towards the maximum employment as well as lower inflation. Um, again, those just being two really hot topics. And again, why are those two items being pushed? Well, because people care about those items. And typically, we don't get the things that we want in Congress being passed. But the reason why is a lot of our people are going to be, I mean, I mean people, a lot of Congress and Senate members um, and House members, um, I know Congress in general, but a lot, of, a lot of those members will be doing things that their constituents want and that the public feels is necessary because of November midterm elections, where we're going to see a lot of people being replaced um, on our two-year cycle here. So again, um, that is very important to recognize that that is one of the factors behind this push. But also, um, how is the Fed supposed to raise um, to maximum employment? That is not something that they handle. Um, I believe that is something that they are trying to handle, obviously, um, with a dual mandate. But um, what the problem comes down to is individual states. I, um, I, per I personally think individual states should have the most power, but I think that there's a lot of individual, individual states that are hurting employment numbers. The reason I say that is um, thinking about um, a lot of states who are still doing um, recovery programs, for instance, the inflation relief program in California. I'm only saying that because that's the biggest one and the hottest topic right now. It's because they're printing money in the state to send out relief checks. Are relief checks great? Yes, they are to help people. Absolutely. But this printing is causing more inflation. And so that's not really helping people who want to go back to work. And so, again, it's a mix of not having good jobs, um, but also we have a lot of jobs. So people may just need to sock it up and go get jobs. But how is the Fed going to do that? I don't know. It's not really the Fed's job. So um, that's kind of weird. Anyways, um, looking at the overall market, uh, what we're seeing here from a one minute perspective is that um, we have this trend here playing out. Let's actually zoom out to SPY. Um, you can see here what's going on. Uh, the market got down a lot. You can see here how we have our overall trend on the market right here with our upside right here and our downside right here. So obviously, we would prefer to be inside this range to have more of a bullish day um, and then be down below it for more of a bearish day, um, moving down to around 390. So again, uh, we'll get into more of these levels after we watch our small trading um, account series um, episode number three, which is going to be the final episode in our trading account series. Then we'll be right back with market plans, market breakdowns, and top stocks. So let's get that train. Hey guys, welcome to the last video in the Growing a Small Account mini course. Let's just jump into it right now. So again, the course outline, what we covered so far is the golden rules for growth, aka set up a risk mat management strategy so that you're making sure that you manage your risk, set up a trade setup, make a checklist for that setup, and then increase your size responsibly. All right. And then in video number two, the video we just went over is setups for exponential growth, walking you through step-by-step -step how to implement the strategy of the software for investing, for swing trading, and for options. All right. And now in this video, we're going to go over it's meaningless without this mindset. So let's jump into that right now. What we're going to be covering in this video is a growth mindset mindset, handling losses, surviving bad markets, and keep the vision. So let's jump into that right now. So a growth mindset is defined as this, believing you can develop your talents over time through hard work strategies and inputs from others. So what does this mean for you? It means that you believe you can become a better trader and investor over time by putting in the work, by focusing on the right strategies, and by asking for help when you need it. So guys, if you want to become a if you want to become successful in this world, you need to make sure that you believe this, that you believe that you will become better over over time and you will get more successful as you put in the work, as you follow a right strategy, a strategy that actually makes money, and you ask for help when you need it. If you don't ask for help, then you're just going to stay stuck and stay in the same place you were from a year ago if you don't start asking for help.
Anyway, so in order to put this into practice, you need to understand that one, small gains add up over time. You're not looking for a huge home run 100% stock every single time. You're not looking for even a 50% return every single time on a stock. 10% 10 returns in a matter of a month or two months is an amazing return. It is really good, guys. Most people make 7 to 10% in a single year. If you can make 10% in two to three months, that's amazing. So guys, make sure that small gains add up over time. So 10% in two months, the next month you make 5%, the next month you make 2%, the next month you make 3%, and the next thing you know, by the end of the year, you're already up 30%. And it's just because you focus on making reliable um, setups and trades that matched your checklist, you followed the system, and you didn't make huge returns, but you made small returns that added up over time. Also, number two, you need to understand practice, practice, practice. This is the same thing that I went over with swing trading. You need to develop the confidence in your system, and you need to make sure you understand how it works. And as you start to implement a system, like a basketball team doing a play, as you start to play that or do that play more, you start to become familiar with who's in what place, who's where, when am I passing, when does this uh, play fail, as in when does someone get in the way, and then that's how you know how it works. That's the same thing with trading and investing. You want to practice and practice and practice. As you start to look at stocks more, you'll start to understand what's healthy, what's normal, and um, what defines a good setup. And so that's why you need to practice, practice, and practice, watch the charts, and start to move on from there. Step number three is you need to observe your progress over time. Are you slowly getting better? AKA, have you always been losing money and now you're breaking even? Or have you always been breaking even and now you're actually making money? And so you want to make sure that you're increasing over time. If you, for some reason, over three months are not improving, especially with the software, then the first thing you want to do is the one, if you, ha if you haven't already, go through all your past trades, lo look at the stocks, and try to figure out what happened. Next thing you want to do is reach out to someone, whether that's through the private Discord group chat that that we have here or reaching out to me via our support channel you have to reach out to someone to figure out what's going wrong and how you can improve all right step number four to implement this growth mindset observe the habits of successful traders figure out what the people who are successful are doing and a great way to do this is in our private community group chat for software users go into the pnl section find those people who are making money dm them message them whatever be like hey what are you doing that's helping you make this money? And when you do that, then you can figure out the setups that's working for you. Now, again, I did contact a lot of our best users, our most profitable users, and I said, hey, what are you doing? And they told me exactly what they're doing, and I put those into systemized checklists and a training series. So if you haven't watched that software training series with the checklist for the screener, the analyzer, and the watch list, um, make sure you contact me or go to uh, www that the impeccable stock software.com slash ft dash one two three four and so that will start the video training series and that's going to be awesome that's put together by all the best software users anyways the last one for implementing a growth mindset is always seek more knowledge you need to constantly be learning and this is pretty evident right and just in life in general you're not improving you're not increasing your life unless you're learning and so we need to do that as well in the investing and trading world all right guys that is how you implement a growth mindset now handling losses this is something we're all going to have to do it's something i do still even though i've been doing it for a while because losses is something that everyone has to deal with so you can't always be a winner but you can always come back and that's what you need to remember all right so in order to handle losses you need to do the following one do not be too hard on yourself. Everyone loses, right? We're not gonna go um, drinking, and we're not gonna go. We're not gonna get drunk over the fact that we lost money. We're not gonna. We're not gonna go jump off a cliff for the fact that we lost money, right? As we discussed in video number one, you have your risk management in place. You know how much you're willing to lose, and you should have set up your trade to make sure that you only lose that much money. And so, because of that, we should be fine. We should be under our risk tolerance level, and so we should only be risking the amount of money we can afford to lose. But when you do lose, don't be hard on yourself. It happens. Everyone loses. 
now we need to move on and see what we can do. So once we get over the fact that we lost money, we're going to go to step number two, which is remember why you made that move. Why did you invest in that stock? Why did you, why did you, why did you trade that stock? Did it meet your checklist setup for that stock or for the system? If it did, that was a good trade and you can move on. If it wasn't, figure out why did you invest in the stock when it didn't meet your checklist? Do you even have a checklist? Do you have a system? If you don't start there, if you figure out that, let's say it, you forgot one part of the criteria or, 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 or the checklist, then the next thing you want to do is, all right, Austin, in order to buy the next stock, I need to make sure it meets every element on my checklist. And that's what you need to start doing to yourself. Now, if it was the right setup, then you'd be like, okay, this was just the time when it didn't work. I need to move on. Now, number three, don't compare yourself to others. Guys, everyone loses money at different times. Even if the market is doing well, there's always going to be somebody making money and you'll see them making money. I used to compare myself to these people all the time and it would frustrate me because it would make me more mad, right? These guys just made money. And sometimes it'd be like they made money on the stock I just lost money on and we traded in the same day. Like, how is that even possible? And just don't do that. Just understand you are on your own journey. You are on your own path. And that may not be the same as their path. They may be a few chapters ahead in their book than you are in yours and so just focus on following your system and it'll eventually get there. All right, the last step to handling losses is it's okay to take a break, take a week break from the market or even just just enjoy a day break, um, a two day break, something to help you clear your mind, get in the right mindset, a growth mindset, which we just discussed, and then getting back to action. All right, so number three in this video is surviving bad markets, right? There's always a bad market. For every system, for every trading strategy, there is a bad market. And so for this one, it's gonna be this. The trending band system thrives in bullish and bearish markets, aka it thrives when the market's either going up or the market's going down, right? Because with this system, we can make money up and down, but it lacks in a range-bound market. AKA it lacks, it has a hard time profiting when a market just goes up and down as a range bound market. AKA when a stock is inside the band, inside the green and red lines um, is when it suffers. So, or maybe you just are struggling right now regardless of the market conditions. So what am I saying here? Which means you're either losing money because one, the system is in a bad market, or you're just struggling right now, right? Like you're having a hard time. Maybe there's something personal in your life. Maybe you just don't have confidence. Maybe it's just the wrong stocks you're picking, right? And so it's either the strategy or it's your mindset. And so you kind of need to uh, figure out which one it is. And now the easiest way to figure this out is if the stock is within the green and red lines, um, a, a, aka you're looking at the chart, uh, the line chart on the software and it's blue. If the line is blue, that's going to be a range bound market and not the best time to buy. And so because of that, uh, it would be a market issue. Now, if it's not because of a market issue, it's because other people are making money on that stock too. It's probably a mental issue in your head. And that's something that you need to readdress. Okay. So in order to survive bad markets, you need to one, remember, trust the statistics. Guys, you're losing money. It may, it may not be the best time to trade right now. But regardless, the statistics show that you have an 83% accuracy rating with this trend following system. It works over the long run and it's been back tested for decades. So you need to understand to trust the system even when you have bad um days and bad weeks. All right. The last thing you need to remember is it's okay to not trade or invest. It's okay to sit in cash while you wait for a great trade setup. If you are just putting in money because you think you always have to have your money invested, that's a bad way to think about it. You should only be putting your money into a stock when it can make you money, right? That is the goal of a stock. A stock is an asset and an asset is meant to make you money. So you should only be putting your, uh, your money in a stock that is going to increase in value. If a stock is not going to increase in value or if it, or if it doesn't have everything on the checklist or on your system to actually make money, then don't buy it because you're just going to lose money. All right, guys, that is my two-step system for surviving bad markets. Now, last, last but not least is keep the vision. Remember that you will achieve your long-term goals regardless. Guys, if you invest $1 over 30 years at a 15% return, which is something you can absolutely strive for and get with the software, then what you're going to get is you're going to have $66 by the end. What does that mean? It means 66 times your money at the end of that 30-year period. Again, if you invest $1,000, that means 
means you now have $66,000. If you invest $10,000, you now have $660,000. That is a lot of money. So remember, one, remember your why. When times are hard, when you're getting, when, when, when it's tough, remember your why. Why did you get started? One, did you want money? That's fine if that's your reason. Did you want more time with your family? Remember that. Remember why you're doing this and that will help you keep the vision. Also, focus on the long-term vision. Guys, like I just said, it is almost inevitable that you make money if you stay invested over time. So make sure you do that and the long-term vision will work. All right, guys, this has been Growing a Small Account. I hope you have enjoyed it. We've gone through um, your system, the strategy, and the mentality that you need. Thank you so much for watching this video. Sorry for that delay. And anyways, all right, yeah, so that was the training video for today on how to grow a small account. That concludes the small account um, series that we're in. Now, uh, let's go into the most important factor. Let's see what the overall market is doing. Let's create our game plan, and then let's move from there. So the first 15 minutes of the market has ended, which is kind of um, our important zone because we form our 15-minute range. Um, and so our 15-minute range for the day is uh, from here um, to about here. Um, and again, you can see we're trading in the upper portion of this range. Now, most likely this is because of the gap that is formed. You can see here the gap that formed um, from this morning where we closed around here yesterday on Wednesday, and then today we open um, down. And so again, we're, pro we're probably filling this gap. Just because we're filling the gap to the upside does not mean that we're going to continue to the upside. Although I'd like to continue that direction, filling a gap has no waiting on the direction the overall stock is going to go just filling the gap is something that naturally happens and then from there the real direction continues um so again that's kind of what you're looking at but when you look at the first 15 minute um range it kind of gives you an idea of the rest of the day um because typically um again this isn't statistically um proven but in general what i've seen over, over the last uh few years or i should say about five years of trading and and watching the markets on a daily basis is that when you look at the first 15 minute range, um, when you look at what's happening, for instance, if it's towards the upper portion, it tends to be a bullish day. If it's towards the lower portion, it tends to be a bearish day. If it's somewhere in the middle, it tends to be a neutral range bound day where it just goes up and down. It's crazy. So again, um, this is kind of looking at a um, bullish to neutral day. So again, this just helps give me some, some idea about the day. Again, if it changes, it changes. But let's see what our game plans are for today. So obviously, um, we have a resistance here. If we break this resistance, we're going to have a very strong and bullish day. So if we get up above this level, think very bullish, think very strong, think call options, think buying stocks, etc. If we get below this support level um, right here, where it formed at 394, because um, again, you can see here how strong that level was. If I just remove, if I throw this out, um, this is what I'm looking at. Okay, hold on. Yeah, right here. So you can see here, um, this is a very strong level. Why? Because it acts as resistance right here. Um, resistance, 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 resistance. And now acting as support. This is going to be a very strong level. So again, what we're kind of lo looking at is if it breaks below here, we're going to be bearish, especially down to 388 and then maybe even lower. So again, our three game plans are break above here. We are bullish. Break below here. We are bearish. In between here, we are neutral and range bound. So that is the setup for today, and that is kind of what we're watching with the overall market. Again, based on this and the overall market, we'll kind of have an idea for uh, individual stocks as well. So that's kind of what we're watching. But something that I did want to bring up today um, outside of market an analysis was this comment um, from Sentiment Trader. Um, and so again, this is very huge. Is um, There was a recent chart that came out that he put together. And that says institutions bought a record amount in hedges. So again, what we're seeing here um, is that uh, he says sometimes there's a chart that just blows your hair back. In 22 years of doing this, um, none stands out like this. Last week, institutional traders bought $8.1 billion worth of put options. They bought less than $1 billion in calls. This is three times more extreme than 2008. Guys, what does it mean when they buy puts? Buying puts means they're making money to the downside, which means that if they're buying $8.1 billion worth of puts, that means that institutions are expecting the market to go down, right? They are expecting the market to go against them. So again, there are a couple reasons why I can think about this. First off, $8.1 billion is an insane amount of money 
like literally insane. It's unfathomable. So you can't just say that, oh, this was just a ton of retail traders who came together like they did on AMC and GameStop. No, no, there's no way 8.1 billion just came together from retail traders. I'm sorry, but that's impossible. It has to be from institutions. Um, again, being banks, being hedge funds, being financial advisory firms, being all these types of institutions. Now, again, there are a lot of reasons why I can think of institutions, especially in this period. One and the most prevalent reason is they think a crash is coming. And again, these are the smartest people in the industry, so they, so they think a crash is coming, and that may be something for us to pay attention to. Number two is that they are simply just hedging, right? They're scared. They're afraid. They don't know what's going on. But again, most of these institutions don't act on emotions. So that's kind of a, a position we can kind of push aside. That's just an option to consider. Option number three is also quite viable, which is just that they know that we're getting towards the end of our quarter, right? We're now in Q4 for business. For most businesses, they're in quarter four where they're going to have to um, perform well. And so again, they're simply hedging their position so that if anything goes against them, they can end the year well or hopefully have a positive position or hold on to whatever gains they have using this hedging in order to come out with a positive return. Now, anyways, when we're, when we're looking at the historical return, we look at 2008, you can see here that we reached about a negative two. Um, so again, that's probably about a negative uh, two billion or something um, in speculation here. Um, but that's crazy. But now we're way down here, which is quite insane. So again, this is the extreme thing that we're seeing. And again, if we're kind of through this comments, you can see people saying World War Three is coming. Uh, we've been in World War Three for years. It's just been cold and, and economic uh, maneuvering. And all these comments are quite crazy. But again, they're not completely far fetched. $8.1 billion in put options. Now, the next thing I want to show you based on these options is what is called maximum pain. Um, for options. And so again, the reason why I want to show this is because if we had that amount of buying on options, $8.1 billion of put options being bought again in 2022, let's look at where the options pinning is um, for uh, today. Um, let's see, Max Payne video. Is this it? Yeah, here we go. Um, so what we're looking at here is let's say SPX again, which is the S and P 500. Again, let's come out and look at towards the end of 2022. Where is the market expected based on XPX to rely on? So again, if we come in here, we can see that the market is looking that it's holding a middle zone around 4060. And so again, right now the S and P 500. Um, if we look at just to get the value of the futures, is roughly. 3957. So again, it's not expecting the market based on all these um, buys and I mean, based on all these calls and puts to be placed around the 30, uh, I mean, the, the 4080 level when it's roughly around 3920, right? And so again, it's not expecting as of yet a huge crash. But again, um, you know, t only time will tell. It's just a very important piece of information that you should be looking at. Um, why is it bringing me over here? Because it doesn't like me. Anyways, um, platform stuff. I guess I can't do that. Anyways, this was just a huge, crazy thing that I just wanted to share with share share with you guys. It was shared with me from one of my fi financial advisory friends. Um, and so, anyways, guys, take a take a look at this. Let me know what you think in the comments. Does this mean World War Three? Does it simply mean they're hedging their positions? What's going on? Let me know your thoughts below. thought this was important to share. Um, also, if you want, go follow Sentiment Trader um, on Twitter. He's doing some great stuff over there. Anyways, guys, see you in the next um, segment. And so, yeah, let's take a look at markets now. So here we go. The S&Ps are making a huge run up, trying to push higher, breaking above the 15-minute high and so again that's a very positive sign again the overall idea for today is if we break above here we're bullish if we break below here we're bearish if we stay in here we're neutral so that is the game plan nothing too much with it thank you so much for um staying tuned for the market uh breakdown today we listened to powell talk we kind of broke down some of his concepts we looked at the overall market we looked at uh, how to grow a small account and we looked at um, $8.1 billion of puts being bought and what that means and some options and how we kind of like explore that. So anyways, guys, thank, thank you so much for watching. I go live at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time every single market um, day. So anyways, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you.